Well, hello there. Hello there. <laughs> so, you guys, you're watching the Moonlight Mysteries, where each week we dive into an unsolved mystery and talk about possible theories with our guests. We are so happy that you guys are tuning in this evening. We will dive into a mystery this evening that has baffled many a people for many years. My name is Lisa, and this is Danny from Danny May's Adventures. Her link to her channel is in the description below. So please check out her channel and subscribe. It's totally free. Before we get started this evening, we will be talking about Dorothy Kilgallen. Dorothy died mysteriously in 1965 and was involved with JFK and the man who shot JFK's killer. Before Danny tells us Dorothy's story this evening, I would like to greet everyone into the chat. All right, let's see here. Who do we have? Alan. Good Alan. evening. Welcome. Welcome to Moonlight Mysteries. We are so happy that you're here joining us. Yes, he's my adopted dad. <laughs> he? Yeah, he, he said he adopted Jake and I. <laughs> Uh, and then we have Ron. He says, hi, Danny Mae. Hi, Lisa. Can't wait. The suspense is killing me. I might be <laughs> your next mystery. Ooh. Welcome, Ron. We're super happy that you're here. We love all your support. It means a lot to us. All right. We have Warcraft Ohio. He says, greetings. Welcome yes. back. Yes. Welcome back. All right, and Gino, hi Gino, happy, happy to see you. I hope everything is getting settled in for and your new place in Florida. It's wonderful to see you this evening. And then we have Simply Sapphira May. Who Good could that evening. be? I don't know, <laughs> I have no idea. Might be my pretty daughter. She texted May. me and she says, I love the intro. Oh, yeah. well, good. Oh, Lisa um, did all that. She's incredible. Oh, thank you. I enjoy making intros. It's a lot of fun. I get so involved in what and when I'm making it, I'll spend hours <laughs> trying to put it together. Hi, Junker Necker DIY. Great to see you. Thank Hello. you for this evening. And Gino says, getting more and more hectic, but the move is only a week away. Gino, I don't know how you're doing that. I don't, I, I have to move soon, possibly. And I'm, I'm really anxious about it. So my hat's off to you. My yeah. Actual. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a cute hat, by the way. Ah, Hi, well, I am here for more Russian French impressions from Danny. Laugh out loud. <laughs> Can you throw him a little one real quick? Well, how are you doing this evening, huh? Uh, Spasiba <laughs> for joining us. Oh, <laughs> oh Naomi, awesome. I'm invited by Papa Ron. Well, thank you so much for coming this evening. We greatly appreciate it. All right, you guys. So as we go through this story, um, well, first, really quick, I have to give a disclaimer. This story does have an act of violence in it. So before continuing to watch or listen, this story may not be suitable for some audiences. And the sources that we're going to be using, Danny's going to be um, reading a lot of sources from Wikipedia this evening. And just so you know, as we're reading and sharing clips, um, we will do our best to greet new people that come into the chat or if you have questions or maybe if you want to add into what we're discussing this evening, you're more than welcome to do so and um, we'll definitely do our best to share that with you. So, um, okay. So, let's see. Oh, and also I wanted to tell you, after we complete the story that we're about to tell you um we're going to talk about theories possible theories and we would love for you to share your theory 
and we can discuss that. So without further ado, Danny, please tell us about Dorothy. Yes. And, and you know me, I always have to start out by saying something that you don't ask me to say, but um, make sure you hit the like button. If you're not blue and we know you or somebody else knows you, we could turn you blue. Just make sure that we know that. Um, and, and Lisa will do, um, you know, she'll, she'll be keeping track of the chat, chat so that I could keep on track. Um, so, um, first of all, I, I, I love that we're covering the Dorothy Kilgallen, um, story now because it's November 3rd, which is my sister's birthday. Happy birthday. And thank you. And then, um, Dorothy actually died on November 8th in 1965 and that's like five days from now so we're kind of doing like a tribute to her but I do want to know you all to know that um Papa Smurf Ron suggested this case and so we want to thank him so much yes. for that and if anybody else um wants to um, show, you know, tell us about the cases that they want to be heard, then email us. It's at Jake from State Farm. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> that's, that's an inside joke. But we do have Moonlight Mysteries at yahoo.com that we just started. And both Lisa and I will be able to look at into the email. So if you have any stories that you would like us to cover, uh, preferably older stories, stories, you know, that are kind of murder mysteries. Um, we don't know exactly what happened. Just let us know. So yes, sure. And you guys, um, just in case you missed the email to reach us, it's in the description below. Sorry, go ahead. No, <laughs> awesome. So on November 8th, 1965, Dorothy Kilgallen was found deceased in her Manhattan townhouse. Sorry, Danny, I'm going to share some photos of her. That way people can get a little bit of a visual as you're talking. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Unmute your mic. There you I go. got it. Yeah. So yeah, she was found deceased in her Manhattan a townhouse and her death was determined to have caused um, to have been caused by a combination of alcohol and barbiturates. So the New York City medical examiner James Luke um, he, report said acute ethanol or, and barbiturate intoxication circumstances undetermined in regards to whether she took her own life or if it was an accidental death. So, who is Dorothy Kilgallen? I'm so glad you asked, Lisa and panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, her actual name is Dorothy May Kilgallen, and I love her name because her middle name is spelled the same way as my middle name, May, M-A-E. She was born on July 3rd, 1913 in Chicago. And she was the daughter of a newspaper reporter, James Lawrence Kilgallen, and mm -hmm. his wife, May Ahern. Or Ahern or Ahern? Someone's going to correct me on that, I know. You guys, sorry, just so you know, if we butcher someone's name, we're, we're apologizing ahead of time. Okay, oh, yeah. <laughs> Apologize for everything in advance. <laughs> so, in 1920, um, International News Service uh, hired... James, her dad, as a roving correspondent based in New York City. And I was like, what's roving? I had to look that up today. <laughs> roving means that they move around a lot covering, you know, different um, cases. So um, they settled in the Brooklyn, New York um, in the 19, in 1920, once he got that job. Um, Dorothy was a student at, um, okay, I'm going to butcher this name too, Erasmus Hall mm -hmm. High School, E-R-A-S-M-U-S, -E -R Erasmus, mm -hmm. er Erasmus, 
Paul sounds, High School. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, me neither. It sounds good to me. And and just so you know, um, Alan says you sound great, Danny May. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Alan. You have no idea what I've been through today. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll explain afterwards, but, uh, so this is what I love about her. She completed two semesters at the college of new Rochelle, um, new, new Rochelle. Rochelle? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then she dropped out to take a job as a reporter for the New York evening journal. Um, so she dropped out. She's a high or a college. Hi, Bubs. Is she blue? Uh, is she's oh okay. You know what? I'm gonna go through real quick. I make okay. some people blue, blue, blue. And if not, we'll definitely do it tomorrow. So you guys, just so you know, I, the people that have wrenches in here, if someone comes in and they're being inappropriate, just time them out for us, please. All right, go ahead. Sorry. No worries. Um, so, so she's she's a college dropout. She dropped out to take a job as a reporter for the New York Evening Journal. So, uh, the people who um, the newspaper or excuse me, the newspaper owned by um, who owned the New York Evening Journal. Mm -hmm. uh, was owned by Hearst Corporation, which is also known as, um, who, who also owned the international news service, the people that, um, the person that her, uh, father worked for. So let me say that again. I apologize. It's okay. It's okay. So she worked for New York Evening Journal and that mm -hmm. was owned by Hearst Corporation and then her father was an employer of the international news. So she was basically kind of like a coworker on separate like uh, newspapers that was owned by the same corporation. So it's right. all in who you know, it's all in who you know. So yeah, remember and, that. She, and she got a little inspired to be a reporter because of her father. Yes, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. good point. So another awesome kick-ass thing about Dorothy is that in 1936, when she was like 22 or 23, depending on the month, mm -hmm. you know, because she was born in July. So um, mm -hmm. they just said 1936. She competed with two other newspaper or New York newspaper reporters in a race around the world using only means of transportation available to the general public. So oh. she was probably flying, taking buses and um trains trains planes and automobiles and what? she was the huh i said right that's all yeah Sorry. so she was the only woman to compete in the contest and she came in second place oh so wow. second that's out right. of third but she was the only awesome. woman to compete yeah mm -hmm. so she described the event in a book that she actually wrote which is called girl around the world which is also credited as a story idea for the 1937 movie Fly Away Baby, starring Glenda Farrell as a character partly inspired by Dorothy. Oh. So, I mean, even in the 1936, like in her early 20s, she's this kick-ass woman, and I, I totally love her for that. So in November of 1938, Dorothy began writing a daily column, The Voice of Broadway, and the column, um, which she wrote until her death in 1965, featured mostly New York show business, um, news and gossip, but also covered politi politics and organized crime. And this is really where she gets her name. Like, she's the Barbara Walters at this time. She's the right. Oprah Winfrey. She's, like, as a journalist in the, in the 1930s. Mm hmm as young as she was and as you know a woman um she went so far beyond what most people did and um and she was like a superstar she was, so, determined. She was determined very determined yeah yeah 
Um, so this gained so much success that she moved um, her parents and her sister. She had a, has a sister that was uh, six years older than her. Um, so she moved all of them in with her until she got married like two years later. Mm -hmm. So here I say two years later. So yeah, so April 6, 1940, mm -hmm. Dorothy marries Richard Colmar, mm -hmm. a musical com com comedian, actor, and singer. A uh, comedy actor and singer, and they had three kids. So Richard, um, nicknamed Dickie, who was born 1941, mm -hmm. so a year later. Jill, who was born 1943, and Carrie Coleman, who was born 1954. Um, and they remained married until her death, um, but it became, it kind of came um, a strange marriage, you know, right. later. Right. Yeah. yeah, he ended up, um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't he ended up cheating on her, right? And and I think she she found them in bed together. Now that I didn't hear. I know that he was having problems with his, um, with his work and he started drinking a lot. Um, but it doesn't surprise me in the 1930s that, or forties that, um, that, that would have happened, even though it should surprise me. Yeah. I'm um, actually, and I'm, you may get to this and I'm so sorry if I'm jumping ahead, but what I learned was that she caught them in bed together the husband and i'm not sure it may have been his secretary I, i'm not sure but it was in the room remember you mentioned earlier when she passed right it was in her her apartment in manhattan correct yeah and so the room that they found her passed in was the room that she had caught her husband cheating on her with so she never would go in that room she wow. did not like to go in that room. So, okay, go ahead. Sorry. That's, that's totally bizarre. And it, it's making my head like spin right now because yeah, <laughs> there's so much at the end. Yeah. So wait for it, everyone. Wait for it. I'm on page two out of a hundred. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot though, you guys, to this story and it, it's pretty amazing, but go ahead. Dan, and, so. and it's constantly evolving and, and no worries, Lisa. No, I appreciate that. Um, your input and everything. So, so early in their marriage, Dorothy and Richard uh, were both, um, they both launched careers in network radio. So mm -hmm. Dorothy ran her radio program, which was called Voice of Broadway. Mm -hmm. And Richard worked um, a long stint in the nationally syndicated crime drama in which he played Boston Blackie. I have no idea what show that was and no idea what it means. But what's really cool in this situation is uh -huh. beginning in April of 1945, Dorothy and Richard um, co-hosted uh, it, its WRAM radio talk show called Breakfast with Dorothy and Dick out of their yeah. own apartment. Yes. Which is so cool. I mean, she's a pioneer of a woman. She pioneered this. What are we doing right now? You know, you're in your right. house. I'm in my RV. And yeah. they're in their house. I mean, granted, their apartment had 16 rooms. Right. right. <laughs> but I, I was just like, think of all the podcasters and YouTubers and, you know, other media outlets that do work from their home doing what they did and i just thought that was so incredible because that was in 1945 so um so yeah so uh breakfast with dorothy and dick was a mix of entertainment once again with serious issues whatever that means you know like you know crime investigation type of stuff right. and um and that ended in 1963 i guess during that time after world war ii they were getting rid, rid of a lot of the radio shows and and they became one of the last that they got rid of so most of most people who know Dorothy Kilgallen knows her from What's My Line. 
Yeah, and real quick, you guys, I have, sorry, I have a clip. Can I play it now? Yes, yeah. All right, here, here we go. Time now for everybody's favorite candy game, What's My Life? American and papers coast to coast, Miss Dorothy Kilgallen. On my left, we have a charming visitor and one I know you'll be very glad to see on the panel tonight. That attractive humorist, Mr. Sam Levinson. So yeah, you guys, um, just just to add into that, it, you can go on to Amazon Prime and watch a lot of those TV shows. It was actually a great TV show. And they also have them on YouTube. So if you guys want, you guys can go in and watch some of the reruns. She was amazing on that show. And she actually, some of the things I had read, she was great at the questions she would ask because she could uncover who the person was that they were trying to guess what their occupation was. So yeah, it was, it was great. Okay. Sorry, Danny, go ahead. No, that's awesome. And, and like you said, like she was one of the persons who like undercover. Hi, John Jones. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Very clever. And Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know what that means. I thought he was subscribed. <laughs> so, um, do well, you know what I have anything? to say real quick? Sometimes when people subscribe, that subscription falls off. Oh. So, yeah, I see that a lot. Okay. Sorry. Her, um, yeah, yeah. So she did do a couple movies. Um, there's a really cute video that I saw of her on, on YouTube um, of a movie clip that she was in. And, and you all could look that up. We just, oh, Bill, hello. Welcome, welcome. So, yeah, she was um, on its first broadcast, which aired uh, February 2nd, 1950. And she remained on the show for 15 years until um, her last live being November 7th, just one day before her death so sorry I guess I should I'm going to read a couple of these comments real quick yeah yeah go ahead so um Ron says Dorothy did so many things before her time she was so loved by so many people especially her co-host on what's my line and then um Bill hi I'm so glad you're here thank you for coming me too Bill yes um yeah, Lisa, yes, her into integration skill was amazing. Yeah, you guys, if you get the opportunity, um, please go in and watch some of her episodes on that show. She she was outstanding. Oh, and we just had someone else come in here. Dark County Picker. Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming in this evening. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, hi. Naomi says, I never knew about Dorothy. She was beautiful. Yes. Yes. Was she was absolutely um, beautiful, intelligent, and um, we lost her too soon. Too soon. Okay. Oh, real quick. Boatman, Boatman. Hi. Welcome. Hi, welcome. Boatman, Boatman. Good to see you, hon. Okay. Sorry, Danny. Go ahead. Well, so, so let's go back into the night of her death because um, um, her last show was November 7th, 1965. She passed away November 8th of 1965. Mm -hmm. um, after, okay, so you told me something that is not on Wikipedia <laughs> and, and I don't know where you saw it, so I don't know who to cite for it, but you were telling me, hi, Jamestown. Um, you were telling me that um, she, um, her, uh, the people that, you know, dressed her, did her makeup and everything and put her in like kind of a formal gown. And, and then when she came out on stage, she was wearing a totally different outfit. Do you want to explain that a little bit more, Lisa? Oh, I am sure. So it was her hairdresser. Now her hairdresser would go and Mark, Mark, uh, uh Sinclair. 
Sinclair. Yes, Sinclair. He would go and do her hair all the time and help her get ready for the show. And if she had other important engagements, he would come to her apartment um, when she needed him and take care of her. Now, the night that her last show, so she, she did a show on Sunday and he went to her apartment, he got her ready. And then um, he said that he had gotten her ready in a beautiful gown. And then she went to go do the show. And when he saw her on the show, she had something else completely on as if she was going to possibly go meet somebody afterwards. And then, um, yeah, so that's, that's that. I don't want to jump ahead. There's a little bit more. So. Yeah, and we got to remember during those times, Lisa, like, like if you went out like you are now dressed, you would be, I, I said flight attendant, but yeah. <laughs> from the 1940s, but, um, uh, but I mean, you couldn't just wear like jeans and t-shirts like we do, like all the time or, you know, it, it, it's like, if you go to their styling of clothing is just like, this is for evening wear. This is for, you know, the show, this is for a casual day, you know? Right, right. So it was very particular during those times to determine what you were probably doing, you know, based on what you're wearing. Right. So, um, that night, and I saw this episode on YouTube, um, but, um, I, I saw the episode where Dorothy was able to, there was a lady named Catherine Stone and, um, her occupation. So if anybody doesn't know what, uh, who's like, or, um, what's my line, mm -hmm. basically a person like, so Lisa comes on there and, and, um, she says, I'm, do, I, you know, they, the panel asks her a whole bunch of questions like yes or no questions. And, um, and she would answer yes or no. And the host would help her answer questions. So Catherine Stone sold dynamite and Dorothy was able to guess that. And, yeah. um, and so Dorothy was just like, Hey, you know, we're going out tonight. Why don't you come hang out with us? And she was just like, I'd be honored to do that. You know, I, I'd, I'd be honored to hang out with you all. So right. <laughs> Dorothy ended up going to PJ Clark's and, um, she met up with her pr producer, um, right. Bob, Bob Bach. And, um, she said, Hey, I'm going to the Hyatt Regency and, um, Catherine Stone met, um, Dorothy at the Hyatt Regency where she was hanging out with this man that Catherine Stone didn't recognize. Um, so, um, but I guess she, it was alleged, allegedly she had had a couple drinks with Bob Bach and, um, before she went to the Hyatt, the Hyatt was just a couple blocks away from her house. Mm -hmm. So Catherine Stone saw her at this restaurant, kind of probably in a hidden corner, you know, talking mm -hmm. to this man. And then, um, eventually Dorothy goes home or, I mean, who knows what happens at, that's like pretty much the last thing that people had seen, um, except for 9 a.m. And, and, and here's where it gets really crazy. And here's where there's like so many, um, controversies and, um, in, in the case is because, uh, Mark Shaw, who, uh, has done multiple books on her, um, mm -hmm. says at one point at 9 a.m., the butler found her. There's one report that the butler found her in the bedroom. And then the butler tells Richard Comer, um, which was someone that she had been dating, I think. Um, and then Richard Comer had moved her body into that bedroom the bedroom that you were talking about that she never slept in mm -hmm. because of probably the affair that she, you know, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then another person said, no, the butler told Richard Calmer, but her body was found in the bedroom that she was <clears throat> in. Nonetheless, around 10 a.m. an hour later, Mark mm-hmm. Sinclair, her ha- hairdresser, um, goes into the bedroom, discovered her body. Um, he came over to get her ready for like a school meeting for her son and mm-hmm. he discovered her body mm-hmm. in, in a bedroom that she never slept in. Mm-hmm. She had her hair piece in that she had, you know, the, um, and, and I don't know if it's just like to make your hair more voluptuous or if it was actual, um, uh, you know, hair band or something in her hair, you know, mm-hmm. Her eyelashes, um, her fake eyelashes were still on that she never slept in. She was wearing PJs that she would never sleep in. Once again, in a bedroom, she would never sleep in. She had a book out that she had already read. And she was known, like, every time she read, she had to use her eyeglasses. Her eyeglasses were nowhere to be found in this room. Right. And then there was a glass of liquid, assuming water, that was like too far for her to reach, but there were three different barbiturates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was never known to be using those. Right. In the coroner report. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I know I'm not going to, um, can I add to that really quick? Yeah. Fine. So there's multiple things, you know, that have happened um, throughout the years. Some things didn't possibly get reported the same. And um, I read, which is very close to what you're saying, but um, Mark Shaw, the author of the books that he has done around Dorothy, um, he has a site. It's Dorothy Kill gallon.org and on there you can find um video recordings of her hairdresser um telling his side of what he experienced the day before she passed and the morning of so what what i heard him say was that he was the first person that found her passed he came at 9 a.m to get her ready for the day because she had requested him to come and then he found her in that room as i mentioned earlier it's the room that she doesn't go into because supposedly it it's the room that she had found her husband cheating on her in. yeah i wouldn't want to go in that room either right <laughs> and he walked uh sinclair her hairdresser um, walked up to her, saw her on the bed. She was propped up, like she wasn't even laying down. She was, she was propped up on the back, like, like she's leaning on the headboard, I guess. Mm-hmm. And um, he touched her. He knew immediately she had passed. And then at that time, um, it, it kind of goes into what you were saying. She had her hair uh, piece in from the night before when he did her hair. She had all her lashes, the fake lashes on, the makeup. She, And he says in these videos, guys, you guys have to go check this out. So he says in these videos that um, she never, ever went to bed without her makeup t- being taken off. She always took it off. And she was fully dressed, guys, fully dressed. And she was, she was not wearing what he says she would typically wear to bed, which was like pajamas and socks. She was not dressed like that at all. And didn't she have like some kind of slip and robe type of thing? I think so. I think I did read that. But he said the mysterious part about it was that the book, like she liked to read. There's two mysterious parts about the book that was found on her lap. Um, one is the book like if you're reading a book and you set it down on your lap the pages as you're reading across they're at the top right right yeah 
it was turned around upside and down. upside down. So like it looked as she had been placed there by somebody. That's what he's claiming. And he said for years, he never wanted to tell his side of the story because he was afraid, which we'll get into. Um, Danny will get into as we continue the story, the reasons why he was afraid. But um, real quick, Danny, let's see. I think we had a couple of people come in. Susanna, hi. Hi, Susanna. Thank, Thank you so much for coming. Um, Wes, Wes. I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> Thank you for coming, my friend. Um, and let's see, Alan, I think Alan has to take off, just so you know. Oh, yeah, okay. so the, and love and prayers to you. Um, okay, sorry. Okay, go ahead and uh, finish what you were saying. Um, yeah, so her, her, yeah, where her body was and everything. Yeah, yeah, and there's, I, I, that's that's the really weird thing about this case, though, Lisa, is that there's so many people saying different things at different times, and yeah, and Ron, you're right. There were so many things to be afraid of, which we'll get into. Um, so there was like pretty much no investigation. Like everyone was just like, oh, you know, it was an accidental death or she took her life um but it still remained in um the the um the i'm i'm sorry the death reports that the circumstances is undetermined so right. I, I then then you should like investigate it if it's undetermined <laughs> Don't you think they're going to investigate it if it's under and un, undetermined? You so know, one, one thing I want to add that I was listening to Mark Shaw. You guys, sorry, Mark Shaw. If you ever get the opportunity, type up his name, look him up. He's he's brilliant. Um, he stated that the coroner. So there's a coroner in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. They did not call that coroner. They called the coroner from Brooklyn. And, and that coroner came up and um, did the report. So what? why would you not have the coroner that's closer come, right? So that's, that's one thing that was like really iffy about it, which we'll get into a little bit, um, but go ahead. Yeah, so, so um, that's pretty much like what the death scene was was like unless you have anything else that you want to say about it mm -hmm. other than the fact that things are still coming up through the investigating uh, investigative work and uh, by the way i love mark shaw i would love for him to be on our show <laughs> well, if, you, if you see this ever i'd love to have you come up and yes please yeah. more about this case okay go ahead yeah and and um through the people that he's known throughout the years um he's he's getting different things and so he has he hasn't ever changed his opinion that um this was a murder and mm -hmm. and i i think he's going more towards one person than another um at this point um in the last interview that i saw you know just because it shows up on youtube like four months ago or a year ago it doesn't mean that the interview actually happened at that time so i don't know what his timelines are um but um so the first person that we need to look into is frank sinatra frank believe sinatra. it or not so okay so you guys, I have a clip of Frank Sinatra, just so you, I I think most of the people in here know who he is, but just in case you're watching this replay. Yeah, I don't think John Jones knows who Frank Sinatra is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, John Jones. Oh my God. Okay, <laughs> real quick. Just give me five minutes and I'll have the other number ready. I'll get a smoke. Next number. <laughs> Look 
car. A conductor with a pipe sticking out of his mouth. <laughs> that's so classic. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that's him, guys. That's him. All right, Danny. So tell us about Frank Sinatra and Dorothy. Yeah, they were fairly good friends for like several years and they were photographed like rehearsing like a radio studio for the 1948 broadcast. And and you got to remember again, not you cuz I know you know her story, but she was a celebrity in those days. I mean, even as a journalist, mm -hmm. like she was more famous than the people that she was actually covering. Even like Frank Sinatra, she was People were like, can I have your autograph? Can I have you? I, I mean, the pioneer woman of her time. I, and once again, I'm so impressed with this woman. And if I had like a half an ounce of what she has, I, I'd be amazing. His then wife. Oh. Mia Farrow, are you talking about Woody Allen's? No, I think he's saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know, John, are you saying that um, Frank Sinatra's wife, Mia Farrow, was on What's My Line um, with Dorothy? Okay, go ahead. Why am I thinking of Woody Allen when he said Mia Farrow? I don't know. Okay, so... Um, so anyway, um, she had a falling out after they had a falling out after she had wrote like this multi-part like 1956 like front page feature story titled The Frank Sinatra Story. And not only did it go out to um, the New York Journal American, but mm -hmm. her own like newspapers across the United States and ran the story like all throughout the United States. So it was talking about who he was rubbing shoulders with, who he was caressing, <laughs> like, uh. and I mean, we all kind of know Frank Sinatra. There's like mob type of, yeah. Um, <laughs> you're like, That's right. Yeah. 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 They, they, I read somewhere that she actually, she was so popular right with her stories that um like you were saying it would go across the united states but it would reach over 400 different newspapers and back then you know we didn't have you know youtube <laughs> right. and, you know i mean yes there was television but it wasn't as popular so a lot of people got their information from the newspaper or radio but, okay go ahead Oh, yeah. And she was doing both, you know, um, well, until 1963. But yeah, so she was it, writing. I mean, she was a magnificent journalist, like front yeah. page, like almost every Fresh time. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Frank Sinatra could have wanted her. It, it, she was kind of known as being a blabbermouth, like she talked. Um, but I got to tell you something, you know, when we were talking about the Gabby Petito case and the Brian Laundrie yeah. case, um, I always said, I always go to WFLA.com because Mia wasn't on WML. Okay. Oh, okay. Awesome. So 1966. So that was after Dorothy had passed. Yeah. So I always go to WFLA because I know that they're not going to say anything unless they can say it. And that's exactly how Dorothy worked. Um, she was so reputable. She didn't say anything that was, she might've talked a lot, but she didn't ever say anything that was not true in, in through her investigation. And so, of course, after that happened, their friendship dwindled and um, turn page now. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and Sin Sinatra made a whole bunch of derogatory comments about Dorothy's appearances. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even Mark Shaw, you know, um, who covered her death. Um, the book is called The Reporter Who Knew Too Much by the mm -hmm. way, so, it, and it's in the links, I think. Um, yes. yes. Yeah, the reporter who knew too much, and he is coming out with another book that, um, and there's other books that I'll talk about, but um, 
I I guess Frank Sinatra called her as the chinless wonder, which was so disappointing to me. Oh, I mean, God. because she has these cute. He must have, and, well, yeah, but he must have felt um, like she was making him look bad, right? So maybe that was some sort of a defense mechanism on his end. Well, there are rumors that he hit on her and she said no, and that's why he started. So that's another rumor. Ooh, I didn't know that one. Yeah. That that because she said no, Tig, stop. Sorry, my dog. Um, Because she said no, that he started, you know, doing that. So, uh, which is really disgusting but um so a a little bit on mark shaw Mm -hmm. um so he has like 20 plus books um there's also a book called collateral damages and it's the mysterious deaths of marilyn monroe um uh, dorothy kilgallen and the ties that bind them to robert kennedy and the jfk assassination Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, mm-hmm. So another conspiracy theory is that, um, has, has everyone heard of Dr. Sam Shepard? Um, his story inspired the movie, The Fugitive with Harrison Ford. Right. Mm-hmm. So if anybody's seen like the movie, The Fugitive with Harrison Ford, you kind of know Dr. Sam Shepard, but... Um, he, um, was convicted of killing, uh, his wife and, um, Dorothy covered, uh, the doctor. Yeah. Dr. Sam Shepard. Uh, yeah, she, she was a journalist for that case. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But you gotta know, I wrote Dorothy covered the Dr. Sam Shepard, a doctor. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, duh. <laughs> Dr. Sam Shepard, a doctor. <laughs> it's okay. So, so anyway. if you're rewatching this, forgive us. <laughs> so, forgive me. Lisa's perfect. No. <laughs> she is. So, so yeah, he was convicted of killing his wife in the trial. Um, it, the trial was set in 1954, so he was convicted. Um, of that, and uh, Dorothy was like so astounded by the guilty verdict. Um, which was front, uh, so she actually wrote this. It was like front page headline because of what, um, what she argued was serious flaws in the prosecution's case. Mm -hmm. And, um, once again, she, she was like a movie star and the judge like took her side. Oh, Jennifer Hayes, my Virgo sister. (laughs) She, um, um, uh, the judge took her aside when she got there for the trial and mm-hmm. he was like, and they talked in his chambers and he was like, can I have your autograph? And she was like, yeah. And, and then he, he was just like, I'm really surprised you're here. And she's like, well, why? And he was just like, um, oh, I forget his exact words, but like, Highly. he's like a hundred percent guilty or he, he's hella guilty or something like that. I, I know you didn't say, I know in 1954, you don't say he's hella guilty, but that's right. what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. So, okay. So, um, so at the time of the Cleveland jury's like guilty verdict in December of 1954, um, mm-hmm. Her, yeah, sharp criticism is what it says um, of it was like controversial and the Cleveland newspaper dropped her column in response. They were like, oh, we're not going to have you anymore. They were afraid they were going to lose readers, I'm sure. Right. Probably. And, and I mean, you know, not everyone does good in this world. We've seen a lot of shady cops out there. Yeah, and, and so I, I kind of feel like they were protecting their own. They were protecting their judge. They were protecting, you know, um, the verdict. And and you got to understand, like, if a person goes to jail, and I don't know if this is the case in the 1950s, but if you go to jail 
Hi, Libby. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so, I didn't see that. It's okay. um, so, um, a person could be, uh, what is it called? Exonerated. And, and then, mm -hmm. you know, then they mm -hmm. take money from the state, you know, for being wrongfully accused. And so right. I think they were just Serving like time and they shouldn't have. Yeah. Right? And of course, a woman saying this in those days, you never want a woman to talk. You know, she's prim and right. proper and blah, blah, blah. So, right, but right. yeah, but she was a controversial journalist and that's why she was so good at what she did. And that's why she, um, you know, did she was famous, right? She, was I mean, so people famous. loved reading her columns and her stories because she she did not hold back right but she didn't say anything unless she believed it right you know and that's that's yes. um yeah yeah incredible mm -hmm. so nine years after the verdict and sentence of dr shepherd you know after he was like went to jail and everything and after the judge had died Mm -hmm. Dorothy claimed that the judge had told her before the start of the jury selection that Shepard was guilty as hell. So, like I said, it wasn't how I said it. He, uh, right. this is this is in quotes, like guilty as hell, you mm -hmm. know. So, there's this attorney called F. Lee Bailey who was working on a um, habeas corpus. So, habeas corpus verbatim in Latin means let you have the body so he did the habeas corpus petition and it's a recourse in law through which a person can report an unlawful detention or imprisonment to a court and request that the court order the prisoner to be brought to the court to determine whether the detention was lawful for his client shepherd overheard Dorothy saying what she did about wait I that was a run on sentence okay so so basically because this attorney heard Dorothy saying what she did about the judge the attorney uh, F. Lee Bailey said mm -hmm. hey I'm gonna do the habeas corpus petition for his client Dr. Shepard mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um so he pulled her aside after he heard what she said. It was like at this party. Once again, she did like to talk. Mm -hmm. And um, he was just like, can you help me out with this? And um, some days later, they obtained a deposition from Dorothy. And um, apparently other people had heard the same thing from the judge. Like, this guy is guilty as hell. So, mm -hmm. I mean before the trial before the jury selection the judge was already saying oh this guy is guilty so because of all this dr shepherd was um had a retire trial and he was released from prison and apparently after his release him and dorothy met at a late night champagne party oh, excuse me, you know and then um uh, after Dorothy passed away, Shepard was retried re and acquitted. Sorry, oh. retried <laughs> is, is retried and acquitted, put in the same sentence. So, so you know, the controversy with that is, is um, you know, uh, the, going against like these big wig people. Right in the judicial system um once again politics will kill you that's why i'm not political <laughs> right right but speaking it's of scary. it's scary though right when you want to make a stance for what you believe in sometimes because not everybody will agree with you and some want you dead for what you say yeah yeah so. And, and there is power. I mean, we were talking about that last week. Um, there's power in money. There's power in um, powerful family. Like when I was telling my mom about this case and I brought up John F. John F. Kennedy, she was just like, oh, do you remember the Martha Moxley case and the um, um, 
uh, John Jones would help me out with this. Um, you, you know, that's a whole nother case, but, um, right. the, the person who was responsible for her death was somehow affiliated to the Kennedy family. And then we were talking about all the other Kennedys that have done like horrible things and have gotten away. Yeah, there's with a it. lot of a lot of strange circumstances happen to people when you cross them. Yeah, I just tell everybody right. that my dad's the president and they don't mess with me. So right. my dad's <laughs> president, leave me alone. <laughs> so speak. Speaking of uh, politics and John F. Kennedy, mm -hmm. we get into like um, a third conspiracy. And this one is really where Mark Shaw, the author, um, really goes towards. And um, once again, he wrote another book uh, called Collateral Damages, where he, you know, because he, he did a bunch of books about John F. Kennedy. He even did a book on Mike Tyson over rape, like, many, many years ago. Yeah. And, and then he covered the Dorothy case and all these people started writing into him and they were just like, do you think there's anything between like John F. K and Marilyn Monroe and Dorothy Kilgallen? And mm -hmm. so he's been looking into it. Um, uh, he did, you know, with the collateral damage book that he has. Um, so John F. Kennedy, um, like Dorothy met him and it's so sweet. And I can't just cite like one. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's he, um, I'm just going to read what he wrote. Mark Shaw was drawn to Dorothy's death was like she wanted him to look and investigate her death. Yeah, I, um, Ron, I saw that multiple times on some videos and basically he feels as though Dorothy's guiding him. Every time he was stumped on a case, he felt like Dorothy was telling him where to go next and what to right. do next. And then he was just like, I'm never going to be able to do this. And then he would end up doing it. And, and, and I really like him, um, you know, because just like Dorothy, where sh she was a college dropout, like um, he said he got like D's in his English class or, or I think that's I I, I I think I'm saying that right he got really poor grades in English class and Mike Shaw um, almost failed out of law school and he was able to become like a criminal I, I think it was a crim I think he's a criminal lawyer correct me if I'm wrong yeah no but, I think you're right okay mm -hmm. and um, and he, he's like everybody tells me it's I'm uh, my books are so easy to read. And he's like, yeah, because my vocabulary isn't very high. I, you know, I'm, I don't have the smarts that, you know, she did. And, and then, uh, there's a really cute, uh, part where I saw Mike Shaw saying his wife, he says, my wife <laughs> keeps telling me that, um, I'm in love with Dorothy. And he's like, well, yeah, I, I, I might be, but, um, <laughs> she's deceased and you're not so i'm sticking with you you know oh. hi daniel welcome hi okay so, so to the jfk um so dorothy met uh john f kennedy um oh, one of her son i don't i don't know what and, and, and help me out if if you know but what okay. one of her sons like brought like um a whole bunch of notes from his third grade class yes. for JFK to, and, and I don't know what um, event was going on to where she met him and her son was able to do that. They went to the White House. That's what I read. Oh, okay. I open doors for Dorothy. Well, I, I, <laughs> she was a celebrity. Sure so. There was an event going on, like you were saying, um, but from what I gathered was that uh, her and her son went to the White House and um, she introduced the son to him. And I guess he was so endearing to her son that she felt um, 
like a like an attachment to JFK. Yeah, like apparently it put like a pin on um, her son's lapel or something, um, and and so after he was assassinated, she um, the way that Mike Shaw puts it, um, and once again I can't cite a particular source. Um, read his book because you'll find it in there. So I'll cite his book as a source. Danny, real quick, um, I don't know if everybody. Um, in here is remembers the assassination, uh, but I do have a clip. And if anybody's watching and they've never seen this before, I'd like to share it. Do you mind? Not at all. No. All right, you guys. Here we go. <laughs> A few days before tragic death comes to President John F. Kennedy, he and the First Lady are the picture of happiness. Their children, John Jr. and Caroline, are to mark their birthdays after the President returns from a trip to Texas. Arriving in Dallas on the morning of the fatal day, he and Mrs. Kennedy are greeted by Vice President Johnson and the mayor of Dallas. John F. Kennedy has been President two years, 10 months, two days. They ride in the familiar presidential limousine. Because the weather has turned fair, the transparent bubble top has been removed. From a fifth floor window, at 12.30 p.m. come the rifle shots that bring death to President Kennedy and seriously wound Governor Connolly of Texas. 29 minutes later, the 35th President of the United States lies dead in a nearby hospital. The presidential limousine bears the marks of violent death. The flowers Mrs. Kennedy carried from the airport are twisted and torn. Shock and disbelief give way to tears. The nation and the world's reaction is one of bewilderment and grief. All right, so that was wow. like, yeah. And um, real quick, Douglas came in. Hi, Douglas. Hi, Douglas. Good to see you. He says, I was in second grade when oh, that Oh, my goodness. Uh, wow. I, I, my mother, um, just to go off a little topic here, but my mother collected a ton of newspapers, and um, she really admired him at that time. So, yeah, and I know that when that happened, and just remembering from history, you know, as a child, um, it, it caused great grief across the nation. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I think about like when I was in, I think I was in third grade when the Challenger exploded and then think of like, you know, my daughter, I don't know if she's still in the chat. She might be working right now, but, um, uh, when the twin, uh, towers, you know, Mm -hmm. the 9-11 event like mm -hmm. I mean things like this really affect everyone they yeah. really really do so thank you for sharing Douglas Ron says I remember watching that on our round TV remember the TVs sorry that would that had the was kind of a round a round screen have you ever seen them I, 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 I've seen them I'm into vintage stuff <laughs> minutes oh That's, wow I remember Douglas I I think I read that somewhere when I was younger but okay so okay tell us more about JFK well yeah so she felt like really you know and it might have been her political stance or whatnot but um she really felt when when he when John FK like was reading all the third grade class notes and everything and and putting the pin on his um on her son's um 
lapel or you know collar or something um she she took it really personally when when he passed and um um and as you all know oswald was charged for it and then jack ruby came in and i i think you have more information I'll yeah tell you what I, I, have, I have a clip of that real quick okay and this, this clip is actually just to give you guys a little idea ahead of time um so this clip you see um oswald walking down the hall um with the sheriffs and um somehow jack ruby gets in where everybody is trying to get him into this armored car and jack ruby shoots him but here we go now this is silent guys there's no audio oh, i was you just gonna blow my nose I thought oh, yeah. the mic. you can see that was oswald mm -hmm. and that may have been the rifle that they claim ended john at jfk and he's walking through the hall here and then now he's shot yeah so um jack ruby gets him now um let's see here i think that that's pretty much it guys oops sorry so anyways yeah tell tell us now where does that go well real quick sorry we've got um ron says when she heard he was assassinated the only thing she could remember was him showing her son that attention because he cared so much for the youth and young people in america yeah yeah um, Okay, so go ahead. Um, tell us a, tell us a little bit more about this. Yeah, I apologize. My left nostril is like <laughs> draining. So <laughs> Just mute yourself for a second. Uh, okay, okay, hold on, real quick. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. okay, so I'll keep talking while she's doing her thing. So, anyways, um, from what I've read, and she may cover this, was that um she was the only reporter that was able to get an interview with jack ruby yeah, so she got two interviews with him mm -hmm. okay go ahead oh okay <laughs> no, I'm i don't want to step over, over what you might <laughs> be ready to say and so you yeah. have the floor well so um so do you know where those interviews were taken Weren't they at the jail, like where he was being held? It, yeah, but I'm I'm wondering what state it was because um, um, for some reason I didn't write it down. But like after, like she had had like two interviews with Ruby, like. Um, Sorry, can I read this real quick? Yeah, yeah. So Douglas says you need to keep researching. Oswald was not the assassin yet. He took the rap, but he was not the guilty man. Yeah, a lot of people believe that, and and we're kind of um, around Dorothy. She didn't believe that either. So, okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, and 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 more so to Douglas is that um, is is that's probably why he was killed ultimately, is because if if he didn't do it they don't want that getting out so so yeah so um i have it in my notes that like um she flew so dorothy flew to the new orleans mm -hmm. and the, told some people that she cracked um jfk's case mm -hmm. and then she told her hairdresser you go straight to new york don't tell anyone anyone that you were here. Like, mm -hmm. don't say that you were here, where you've been, nothing. Yeah, right, and I think um, I had read, and just correct me if I'm wrong, that she had a, what, what, a confidant in New Orleans, and that's why she um, had been flying there to get more information. Because see, she had spoke to Jack Ruby twice, and um, the 
the thought is that Jack Ruby confided in her and told her that this was possibly mob related and that he had her contact somebody else to get more information. Mm -hmm. And that's why she had flown to New Orleans. And I believe you're right. She had went there twice, right? To get well, I, I know she's had like, getting ready to go the second time. I'm not sure. Go ahead. Danny. Yeah, I know she had two interviews with Ruby, Jack mm -hmm. Ruby, but I don't know where where he was. Um, what's that say? That's really interesting, Daniel. He says, I've seen documentaries where they show a bunch of people mysteriously died around this whole situation. Car crashes, suicides, something seems fishy. Uh, yeah, we can't we can't say that word though. Yeah, but yeah. Part... No, okay, no. go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And and that's pretty much what um Mark Shaw like put together with his right. um a collateral damage uh book is is um uh Marilyn Monroe was dating JFK and once he wasn't leaving someone she went to Bobby and then Bobby uh there were there were um uh correct me because I can't find my notes all of a sudden so um oh gosh. okay so, I'll do my best Robert Kennedy, like, um, like, first of all, so the Kennedy parents, like John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy, um, there was the first one who went to war and died in a war. Um, mm -hmm. He just thought, like, all my kids are going to be the presidents. And so we're going to start off with my first son and then John F. Kennedy and then and then Robert. And um, so so Marilyn Monroe was like dating John F. Kennedy and he's like, nope, nope, I got to do it this way. I got to, you know, date this other person. So she started uh, dating Robert Kennedy. And apparently when they went, I keep saying apparently, I feel like that kid on that YouTube video, apparently, apparently, have you seen that? I'm sorry. No. No. Okay. It's funny. <laughs> you should look it up. Um, so Robert um, Kennedy, um, he, uh, um, it started dating Marilyn Monroe, and yeah, because JFK, <laughs> according to history or what everybody assumed at that time, was dating Marilyn uh, secretly. Yeah, happy birthday, He's Mr. Married. President. He's married, right? So, um, any she wanted him to leave his wife and be with her. And he would never do that. So, and then she dated the brother. That that's what history says. Yes, and and also the brother Bobby. Um, they were allegedly doing some type of bad things in in the polls, where. Um, um, they were getting more voters from like these, the underground world is what they called it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people were voting um, for Kennedy and they were like, okay, but if he wins or when he wins, you got to keep us out of the, you know, um, the light, you know, you got to keep us underground. So. Right. Douglas says the same people that had JFK killed also had Jimmy Hoffa killed. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I wanted to, and Danny, I don't know if you're going to um, get into this or not, and I'm sorry if I jump ahead, but while we're on the topic of JFK mm -hmm. and what happened, um, so, and I think Mark Shaw shared this in one of his videos, is he said that it all started, the conspiracy started with the father, JFK's father, and that he used his political ties and money um, to get his 
sons into the presidency. Now, because the father originally wanted to be the president. It, now, uh, yeah. So, so the sons, let me get back to he used his money and his political ties. The, the conspiracy is that the father got involved with mob ties or, you know, to, to get his sons where they needed to be. Now, there was some issue because Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, JFK, was trying to minimize um, the mafia and things that they were doing, and they didn't like that. Right. So that's where you get back into that conspiracy where Jack Ruby comes in, correct? So their thought possibly is that Jack Ruby was hired by the mafia to um, get rid of Oswald, because I think Oswald was in there too, may have been hired by them. But they were afraid, I think, that Oswald was going to speak. And so Jack Ruby got rid of him. Now, I don't, again, that's just one of the conspiracies, conspiracies that are floating around. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's almost like a, like a, um, a, a mom who wants to be a model, so they're going to make their child be a model, or a mom right. or a dad that you know. Um, and that's, yeah, um, yeah, I agree, Douglas. Actually, um, that's a interesting point that I totally forgot. That's how uh, Mark Shaw is tying in all these deaths is because Marilyn Monroe specifically said like I you know she was like so day before she died um uh Marilyn Monroe like Dorothy had just did this piece on Marilyn Monroe that mm -hmm. says like oh she has a new dog she's totally in love and um and and then she ends up dead the next day but the night before she died marilyn monroe died mm -hmm. um marilyn saying well i'm i know all this stuff about you know robert kennedy and stuff and 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 the mafia ties or the underground world ties I'm not right and mafia. she was going to expose yeah people. i'm gonna tell everyone Right. Just like Dorothy. She's just like, I, I'm going to crack this case. Right. Right. And, and from what I read with Dorothy is she had wrote, it may have been a, a book she was going to publish about the assassination yes. of JFK yeah. and that she had pages and pages documented around what Jack Ruby had given her and the information that she was able to collect and she it, i guess it was supposed to happen like that that week or very quickly and she was going around telling people i'm gonna expose them all and you know this is it and i've got the truth and she was very gutsy like ron was saying yeah. earlier and people are you know thinking that's their theory is that's why she why she died was because she she did not take her own life at, as an accident right yeah that or or someone, more so on purpose yeah, someone did her in because mm -hmm. now that's the other interesting fact about this case is that this information this book she had wrote it it never turned up yeah where's that at yeah so i that just kind of more points the fingers that they're this seems fishy right suspicious yeah. and she didn't but, do this at her own hand that someone else did this to her Go ahead. yeah like oh no no you're fine um mark shaw is this like if marilyn monroe never would have said 
hey, Robert Kennedy, like, I'm going to, you know. Expose you. Expose you. She mm-hmm. wouldn't have died. And right. then then JFK wouldn't have been um, uh, assassinated. And Dorothy, because she was investigating the case of JFK, would have mm-hmm. never died. You know, and he was just like, I so wish uh, Jackie married an ass. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good, yes, you're right. Oh. Douglas. I remember that. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, y- y- you know, I mean, hindsight is always twenty twenty. It's, it's, I don't know. And I mean, really between Frank Sinatra and Leslie knew the same underground people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, honestly, okay. So like I do think, a poll. <laughs> yeah. I think we should um, do a poll or right. So we talked about a few different theories and one was, um, remind me. So it was uh, Frank Sinatra being uh, upset with her. Because she was exposing his affairs and, and people. That he, right. I couldn't that, find too much dirtiness on him, except he was known for hanging out with a mob, you know. Yeah. Um, and then there's other theories, guys, I know that we're missing here. Um, and the, another one was... The Dr. Shepard case. Yeah, the Dr. Shepard case. I got a blow um, my nose, I'm sorry. Just mute. There you go. Hi, Thomas. Welcome. It's good to see you. And then the other theory would be that we talked about tonight would be the mafia and the ties to the Jack Ruby that she was going to expose the mafia. Which is also kind of an affiliation to Bobby Kennedy. And you got it. I mean, my mom was my mom and I, when we were talking about this case the other day, Mm -hmm. um, we were also, and I can't remember the name, but the, the, one of the Kennedys that drove, um, Oh, he was partying all night at a cabin away from his wife. He had a mistress. She ended up dead in the river. Oh, do you remember Ron? Who is that? Or Douglas. We have um, read about that at one point, and I just, you know, it's not fresh to memory. I think it was like an uncle of theirs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What yeah. was the guy's name? And I don't forgive me if I if I if you feel I'm putting you on the spot, but do you recall the guy's name that was dating or hanging around Dorothy at the time of her passing? Oh my goodness. Um, I know I had, go ahead. I, okay. I did have the name of the person that the butler supposedly told, but I don't know if that was the person that she had been dating, but yeah, there was like fishiness. It was, I think his name was Padakey or Padakey. I'm not, I can't remember Robert Padakey. Anyways, I also had read a theory that he um, they believe he may have been the one that was okay. Let me back up. So Dorothy, she never told anybody um, the information she had learned from Jack Ruby, and according to what I read and watched, um, Dorothy shared some information with the gentleman that she was hanging around. So it's not Richard Comer. I don't know if that was his name. Mm, my goodness. It may be. It may be. Anyways, um, so they were, one of the theories is he opened his mouth and told people, right? Yeah. This information. And there hasn't been any solid proof around that. But because he gave out this information, they were afraid, like I said, she was going to expose everyone that week. Like, it was supposed to come out really soon, this book. And um, they didn't want it to. So they, the theory is that they either 
drugged her drink at that last meeting she had. <laughs> oh no, my doggy. Okay, sorry guys. Live YouTube. <laughs> I have to mute. I'm gonna let you talk. Hey, first. Thomas Chafee. I don't know if you if if he heard me or not when I said hi. So I just wanted to say hi and um. Oh yeah, you're muted. So the Rockefellers met the Kennedys in 1961. Part of that group was other members of the Rockefeller Commission, um, included C. Douglas Dillon, Ronald Reagan, huh? John T. Connor, Edgar F. Shannon, Light, hmm, Lyman. Oh. Why does he have to have so many L's in his names? M. M's. Oh my goodness, you're gonna make me stutter. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, let's see, Douglas wrote, Ronald Reagan would have been 50, year, 50 years old in 1961. Wow. Well, wait. Um, oh, oh, okay. So he's just saying the age of him, because I was like, no, he died much later than 50, but like, okay, I get what he's saying. 1961. Yeah, so, okay, huh. so hold on. There's something that he's saying here that I think I remember reading about. Rockefellers met the Kennedys in 1961. Part of the group was other members of the Rockefeller Commission, including C. Douglas Dillon, Ronald Reagan. Okay, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Ron. Can you um, kind of expand on that a little bit for me? Um, it, it jogged my memory because they're saying that at one point... Um, Someone is stating they witnessed Jack Ruby, Oswald, um, a couple of members from oh. the mafia. And I believe the so there was an officer shot, I uh, believe, on the day of JFK's killing. And I think it was T Tippleton. And, and I'm so sorry if I'm butchering his name. But, and they're stating Oswald shot this, this officer. Well, this secret meeting they're saying happened between Tippleton, Oswald, Jack Ruby, and a couple of members from, I believe, the Mafia. And um, that someone witnessed it. And this was prior, prior to, of course, the JFK assassination. So it was almost as if they had planned this right they planned it all along. They knew what they were going to do. Um, tip, is it Tippett, John? I, I can't remember if it was tip, Tippett or Tippleton. Um, hi, Jason. Welcome. Good to see you. Oh, hi, Jason. Kennedy was a young president. He was only 45 years old when he was assassinated. Yeah, oh, very nice. young. Very young. That's too bad. Um, okay, so back to the theories, guys. Um, okay, so theory number one, right, was Sam Shepard, something uh, good, right? Oh, I, I did Frank Sinatra, Sam oh, Shepard, okay. and then JFK, but whatever order you want to put it in, it's okay, totally fine. Okay, so, <laughs> you guys, if you, um, were curious, right, we want to know what you guys think happened, um, we're curious. So, yes, so the first... Um, one is Frank Sinatra. If you think her death was surrounded by Frank Sinatra type of one, if you think that it had something to do with, um, what was the second one? Did you say uh, Dr. Sam, Sam Shepard? Dr. Sam Shepard. The He's third the one, <laughs> JFK <laughs> assassination. Or do you think that it was an accidental death? You guys, type of one. We, we really want to know. Type of one, again, if you guys think it had something to do with Frank Sinatra. Type of two, if you think it had something to do with Sam Shepard. Three, JFK. Four, it was an accident. And she accidentally um, drank too much and had too many barbiturates. Um, okay, hold on. That meeting took place at yeah that's right ron that is what i read 
uh, uh, well, uh, Jack Ruby owned his own bar, right? Oh. And that was the other thing that people were just like, why on earth would this bar owner just show up out of nowhere and kill this guy? Like, what? Why was he oh. so upset? Why would he do it? And um, and then Stranger there were Stranger things have happened though. Like, why yeah. would the guy who asked for John Lennon's like autograph just come by and like shoot right. him? You know. I think it was set up by his brother. That's how he's thinking of the JFK assassination. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we have John Jones, JFK, um, Daniel says JFK, um, Ron she covered attended Jack Ruby's trial as well. That's correct. That's correct. I Danny, I'm just gonna say what I think and I think it, it has something to do with Jack Ruby, the trial, the JFK assassination, and that mm -hmm. she was going to expose too many people and they were not happy about it and they needed to silence her or there was going to be a lot of people in trouble. Okay, but who's the one person that they have in common? Both Marilyn Monroe, and this is where Mark Shaw is coming along. Both Marilyn Monroe and Dorothy had one thing in common. Robert Kennedy. Well, tell, and exposing mean? things. Marilyn Monroe was like, I'm going to expose you, Robert. You know, Kennedy. Right. And then Dorothy's covering, you know, JFK, Robert Kennedy. And, and, and it, not saying that Robert Kennedy was involved with it, but the people that he might have been trying to protect might have just taken them out. I don't know. Maybe I'm going too far with that. Tell me what you think in the chat <laughs> below. Um, wait, that could have led to it. Me too, Lisa. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think Douglas may have been talking about two different people and what he wrote. But, um, okay, so anyways... Yeah, I, I, that's what I think happened. I totally think that she just, she was too gutsy, which is nothing wrong with that. No. Like, she should be commended for her not being afraid and her telling the truth of what she was able to uncover throughout her life. And uh -huh. that I, I think that she just knew too much. And she was going to expose a ton of people. And the night that she had went and had that meeting right before she went home, whoever uh -huh. that person she was talking to possibly slipped something into her drink. And maybe she got home in time and, like, sat on the bed or something. Okay. And she was only a couple blocks away from her home. So that's very, yeah. you know, or maybe he helped her inside. I mean, or maybe some, yeah, maybe he helped her inside and his plan was to take care of it once and for all and take the, whatever information he, she had in the house. But I also did read the children were there. The children were there. Oh, that, my goodness. And I possibly a nanny of some sort. And they claim they heard nothing. But, oh, wow. but it was a massive apartment. You know, so that's it's possible <laughs> you can walk through there and not hear anything, you know, from another room if you're sound asleep, especially, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning. You're not going to hear anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it is, it is definitely suspicious. And I, something else Mark Shaw says that she was not known to be an alcoholic. Right. Like she'd have a drink here and there, right? But she was never known to take barbiturates. And then she was prescribed, just so you know, she was prescribed barbiturates. And I don't know the brand, so for forgive me. But when they did a, I believe they, um, another toxicologist had saved some of her bodily fluid. 
and they had tested it at a later time and at that time they had found three different types no i'm sorry two different types of barbiturates now they're saying there was two amount enough to have had taken two barbiturates that had been prescribed to her and one that wasn't so where did this other um type of medication get into her system is the question um hold on I, i'm wondering maybe she was disoriented she ended up in the wrong possibly possibly well i i mean that that could that could be the case but how did she get so i mean if she's never been like is that intoxicated before or yeah. she had too much stuff going for her and so and, did Marilyn Monroe. Right. You know? But I did, I did something else, Danny, and like things are, I'm starting to remember some of the stuff that okay. I read. Um, I did read that the hairdresser um, stated that she was very private and, um, she she was scared she told him she was nervous um and that she thought someone was leaking the information and that the only person that could have been was this gentleman Colmar. you were saying i i think that's her name i don't know don't quote me so yeah i mean the fact that when she's when she's um flying to new, or new orleans and she's telling her hairdresser, Mark Sinclair, um, to get get to New York. Don't tell anybody anything. But here she is talking, supposedly. John, hi, love. Oh, my goodness. Hi. Uh, so, anyways. Uh, well, he's not blue, make him blue. Okay, John, you are going to be blue. He's, he's, <laughs> he's a good friend of mine. Um, okay, I'm making you blue. Well, I mean, I think we've all decided per the discussion that we all kind of agree, right, that it was surrounded the JFK assassination and what she learned through Jack Ruby. That's what you think, too, right, Danny? I, I, I do. And, you know, um, I, I've been working on my cold case uh, um, own personal life, like cold case murder. Right. And, um, and like, I had a really bad day yesterday. I think I told you about this. I, 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 I talked to Ron for quite a bit last night because I was just in tears. And so basically like, um, I talked to a psychic, all these new things are coming up in, in, um, her case, which was in 77. Like I was. Well, I don't want to tell you my age. I, I wasn't even born in 77. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> this is all here. So, anywho. Um, and, and the way that Mark Shaw is going after this case and like being so diligent and, you know, he was a um, criminal uh, 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 attorney. attorney. So, so I can't do the things that he can do with my case that he's doing for Dorothy, but it, it's so awesome that he's doing all of this. But yeah, yesterday I was really upset because at the family of this, this victim, um, that my cold case, uh, they don't want to have anything to do with it. And thank uh, God for people like, um, Mark Shaw, that's actually, you know, putting her face on the map and right, investigating right. it. I mean, right. he's such an incredible man. So. Yeah. And you know, you guys, we, we probably missed a lot. This case, there's so much research that we did behind this case and hours of watching um, videos and reading and 
Um, I know there's things that talking we, an hour every night. <laughs> yeah, I know there's things that we missed, and there it may be that we do some sort of um, video around it and try to include more information at mm -hmm. some point. And um, I just want you guys to know we we realize this and that there's i'm sure a lot more to this story but i did want to i just thought of something else guys so sinclair the hairdresser said um he confessed that he never shared his thoughts around that it wasn't her that accidentally took her life that someone else did it because they were afraid at that time they were so afraid to speak up because they just watched what happened to her her sister died, I think it was 2012 or 2014, and still wouldn't speak to anyone. Her older sister, six yeah, years. Scared. You guys, honestly, if you get a chance, go to, it's Dorothy.Kilgallen, no wait, DorothyKilgallen.org. And there is video clips in there of the hairdresser speaking. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, and Mark Shaw, oh, once again, did such an incredible job. And and um, I, I, I just took everything that I have off of Wikipedia. I've, I've watched many right. of her videos and his videos um, to get, you know, information. But I know um, I, I didn't want to cite everything. So, um, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but definitely look up his book, the collateral damages, which, um, um, Oh, and they have it on audio too, guys. Like I know a lot of yeah. people don't read directly from books anymore, but they do have it on audio. And that's in your description, right, Lisa? Yes. I put okay. everything in there. Everything's in the description. Um, all the books that I saw, there's three and then, mm -hmm. and they're on Amazon. And then you guys also, um, if if you want to and it's not necessary but if you do want to help support the show you're more than welcome to um do it through paypal um danny has a paypal set up i have one and we also um any of the super chats that come through in the show mm -hmm. um, we are splitting so just so you know um okay wait hold on ron said something here. So many cases like this are shoved into the back of, or shoved it is. into the back of the filing cabinet. Mark Shaw is not going to let this happen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, Dorothy Kilgallen is, was an incredibly successful yeah. talented beautiful amazing person and mike shaw um mark. is yeah. uh -huh. mark sorry yeah. no it's okay. Um, it's okay is is doing this for her and that's you know and um unfortunately the case that I, my cold case that i'm covering um the terry foster case um her case isn't known and so i'm just this tiny girl um from <laughs> oregon who's you know trying to cover that and that'll come out in a couple of weeks or when more things happen i yeah a lot of things came up so um and well you guys uh, i i'm uh, sorry i was just gonna say real quick i really hope you guys enjoy the show again this is episode two where it's a work in progress we're trying to get a feel for how the flow will go and you know it's a little different because we're doing it live we're almost um sharing educational information at the same time telling a story and uh it's a little bit different because a lot of people will do it as a video and not live so when we do it live there's certain things that happen as we're going through the case and you have to remember danny is in a completely different state than i so we you know trying to mix in video clips and photos and that sort of thing is coming from my side 
So trying to mesh it together, um, it's a work in progress for sure. So, but yeah. really, yeah, we really, really hope you guys enjoy this. Um, if you do, please give it a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. It's totally free. It doesn't cost a dime to subscribe. <laughs> it doesn't. And make sure you subscribe to Danny May if you have not already. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Danny, do you have anything else you'd like to add this evening? Well, you know, I always do. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Um, make sure that you, uh, email us at, um, moonlight mysteries at yahoo.com. It's in the description below. Both Lisa and I could check out that, um, any emails that come in. Um, thank you all so much for being yeah. here. When you guys, Ron, cases you want to hear, um, you'd like us to cover or stories you'd like us to tell, mm -hmm. you can email us. And we'll definitely dive into it um, at some point. We're so, you know, tomorrow is the day that we make the decision on what we're going to focus on for next week. Because mm -hmm. um, it does take a few days to gather everything. Yeah, so, more than that. But, and yeah. Ron, thank you so much for suggesting this case. And it's so appropriate yeah. being well, that it's um, November 3rd and her passing date is five days from now, um, in 1965. And, um, as I always say, let the beauty you love be what you do. Yes. And stay happy, safe, and healthy until we guys see you again. Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Bye.